Thanks so much. Thank you. I want to thank my colleagues in the Office of Admissions very much for bringing us together today. I want to welcome you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Karin grunle Whitaker. I'm Assistant Dean for Faculty and Academic Affairs. I'm also Director of the Summer Language Program and Lecturer on German here at HDS. Welcome. Thanks for visiting. Um, I think meeting here at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences might for some of you be a wonderful omen. So remember this day when you're coming back to be inducted in about two decades. So um, our goal today is to talk to you about the four degree programs that we offer here at HDS so that you can pick and choose which one may be the right for you. We're going to talk about the PhD, the doctoral program in religion that is jointly offered with the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, the MTS, the Masters of Theological Studies degree, the MDiv, the Master of Divinity, and the THM, which is our one-year program that has the title Master of Theology. Just as an aside, um, since I'm also teaching German translation here every year, um, two courses and also one in the summer, um, if you have any questions about your language requirement or your, the summer language program, which is an eight-week intensive language study program specifically designed for the curriculum in theological and religious studies that normally runs from mid-June to early August, um, I'm happy to answer those. I also want to tie in to what was said before about our fantastic libraries. Our Andover Harvard Theological Library is part of my teaching. My classes go there at least one semester. We look at Fraktur writing, that crazy German Gothic script. And we have pamphlets there that we examined that were printed when Herr Luther was still alive. So it was still, we have 500 year old pamphlets that we look at, that we translate, that we read. Um, it's all very exciting. So if you ever have an interest in that, we can talk about that. However, that's not why you're here. You're here to hear about our degree programs. And I'm delighted to be sharing this uh, table with three of our very wonderful faculty members. Each of them will discuss each degree program for about five to seven minutes. And then we'll take a few questions. And then at the very end, I'm sure there'll be room for more questions. But let's maybe first welcome professors David Holland, Dan McCannon, and Dudley Rose. Um, you will find that HDS has an enormous amount of diversity in its curricula and programs, especially in the religious traditions that we study. We endeavor to have depth in all of the world's major religions, as well as many other religious traditions. I can only imagine how difficult it will be for you to pick and choose from such an amazing and overflowing plethora of offers courses, faculty, events, and programs. Good luck with that. Further, you will find the diversity of methodological approaches to the study of religion, whether it's the study of religion and literature, religion and politics, religion and the social sciences, and so on. The diversity of curricula is reflected in the diversity of our student body, the, whose interests range from matters of religion, methodology, ministry, and more. While there are some students here who are interested in the academic study of religion, others are interested in being prepared for all types of professional opportunities, whether this is non-for-profit, government, policy work, positions of public religious leadership, or others go on to further studies, for example, medicine, law, journalism, and so on. All students take classes with each other, um, which is a benefit to us teachers, but also students benefit from being in this very dynamic learning environment with MDiv, MTS, THM, and doctoral students, as well as non-degree students and cross registrants from Harvard and beyond. All are learning together. You'll hear more later about cross registration. Diversity is our strength, and we hope you all will consider bringing your unique talents and your abilities, your experiences and your interests, your research and your learning to our HDS community. 
Before I close my remarks, I would like to give, um, I would like to um, introduce each of our faculty very briefly. I will call on each of them and they will present the program. So I would like to start with Professor David Holland. He's the John A. Bartlett Professor of New England Church History here at HDS. Professor Holland has been at HDS since 2013. He's the Director of Graduate Studies in the Committee on the Study of Religion, and he works very closely with our doctoral students. <laughs> Professor Holland is the author of Sacred Borders, Continuing Revelation and Canonical Restraint in Early America, just to name one of his many of, uh, many of his publications. And I'm so delighted to be see, sitting next to him. I'm a little bit nervous now that I introduced him. So, David, please, we want to hear from you, please, about the doctoral program. Sure. Thank you, Karen. And let me just take a moment to express uh, what a treat this week is uh, for us on the faculty. Every potential incoming cohort brings its own set of contributions and its own personality. And the ability to meet you for the first time and think about the possibility of being in the classroom with you is a genuine treat for me and my colleagues. So I appreciate the opportunity to be on this panel and to have this conversation with you. And I do hope it'll be primarily conversational. Uh, for many of you, a PhD is a few steps down the road, uh, and so a lot of this is a little bit speculative or abstract at this point, which means I'd rather hear your questions than impose my assumptions about what you're thinking about at, uh, at this juncture. Let me say a few words of introduction about our PhD program, though, and it might help to put this in a little bit of historical context. You'll hear um, people talk about the THD, uh, which is a degree that used to be administered and offered through the Divinity School. Uh, and the PhD in the study of religion, uh, which used to be offered uh, exclusively through um, the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences um, over on the yard. Uh, in recent years, actually right about the time I came here, the decision was made to merge these two programs. And so we now offer just the one doctoral degree, the PhD, uh, which is uh, administered jointly by the Divinity School and the Committee on the Study of Religion. The Committee on the Study of Religion is an entity uh, that draws from across the university. Uh, uh, Divinity School faculty constitute about 50% of that committee. Uh, and so the people with whom you work and the committee under which you would receive your degree um, uh, as a PhD student at Harvard would be heavily influenced and uh, administered by Harvard Divinity School faculty and the kinds of people that you'd meet here during your MTS or MDiv degrees as well. Uh, and very recently, this last year, we changed the structure of admission. We used to have 18 subfields, everything ranging from the religions of late antiquity to a very capacious category called religion and society. If any of you have checked out the website, you'll see that that uh, sense of um, self-identification in the process of admission has been quite transformed. Uh, we now ask students to identify an area of interest, a tradition, or a geographical complex, and a set of methods or approaches to the study of religion in, in a way to reflect the fact that many of you are bringing kind of hybridity in the study of religion to your own research agenda, and we want to reflect that in the ways in which uh, applicants can position themselves for admission. So for instance, you could identify as somebody interested in ethnography as a method, and the religions of uh, South Asia as a geographical complex, or you could identify history as an approach or a method uh, and you could identify uh, the Americas as your geographical complex or Christianity as a tradition or Buddhism as a tradition. So to think about yourselves as both practitioners of a method uh, and students of a particular object of study. Uh, and so as you think about your study here, if you're coming into a master's program, you might start to think about yourselves in terms of people who pursue a particular kind of methodological interest and a particular kind of traditional or geographical focus. Our uh, PhD program uh, is quite successful in its placement of students. I always, when people talk to me about uh, pursuing a PhD and thinking about programs, I always encourage them to think a little bit strategically about placement records. About 85% uh, of our students are in tenure and tenure track positions within five years of graduation, which in the humanities is a pretty remarkable track record. And we're proud of that, which is really a 
tribute to the students that we've been able to work with here, uh, high quality and very much committed uh, to the contributions that they're making in the conversations that they care about. Um, we uh, admit somewhere in the order of 13 to 15 uh, PhD students in every admission cycle. That's out of about 150 applications. Uh, and so it's a very competitive process, but that process yields really remarkable scholars. Um, I'll leave it at that now. It's kind of the bare bones statistical introduction to the program and the structural expectations. I might just note in terms of curriculum that our, um, our students are taking on average six to seven years to complete their doctoral degrees. We do have people uh, do it uh, more rapidly and we have had people take a little bit longer. Um, but that's the average and what you should expect as you jump into a program such as ours. Um, the curriculum consists of two years of coursework, uh, which would involve a concentrated field of study, but also the opportunity to take courses outside of that field. In fact, a requirement to take at least two courses outside of that field. We do require a reading knowledge of two secondary languages as part of uh, the criteria for, um, for graduation. Uh, and uh, a comprehensive exam is taken usually in year three, sometimes early in year four, uh, and then a process of dissertating, which takes a few years beyond that. That's the typical path uh, to degree for most of our students. And again, I'll be happy to entertain any questions associated with any of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just a second. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Yara. I'm just wondering, do, uh, do PhD students, um, do they have to um, t like know German or French prior to entering? No, okay. No. Okay, so this is. But yeah. you will. You will. Right. Car okay. <laughs> Karen will ensure it. Okay. Um, actually, the number of languages that qualify as secondary languages is quite broad. So we often think sort of in terms of German or French, uh, but it's actually a much broader set of languages uh, that would qualify. Um, and there is no expectation that you would have that knowledge coming in. There are a lot of resources uh, uh, and supports to make sure that you get to that. It's a, it's a fairly rudimentary, I wouldn't say rudimentary, but it's, it's, it, it's not an uh, insurmountable bar okay. to get to the point where you have the kind of reading knowledge that we expect of our students. Okay, thank you. And as we said before, you have the resources. We offer language courses targeted to our students, MDiv, MTS, THM, doctoral, they're all learning together. There's the summer program, there's the regular year courses. You do not need to worry, we're all here to support you. Mm -hmm. Right up here in the back. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ari. Uh, my question is, uh, are undergrad students welcome to apply to the PhD program right after graduation? They are. It's increasingly rare uh, that a, a student is admitted straight out of an undergraduate program, but it does happen. Um, and, uh, and we have had some students thrive under those circumstances. But if, if I'm being completely candid, that's a tougher argument to make every year. Uh, and, uh, and the number of students that are you know, seriously considered straight out of undergrad seems to be decreasing. But that's not to say that there aren't still exceptions and, and people that you know, take advantage of that exception to, to great effect. Were there any more questions? Well, maybe if you have other questions, we could answer them later. That we could now move on to Professor McCannon. Our next presenter, Professor Dan McCannon, is the Ralph Waldo Emerson Unitarian Universalist Association Senior Lecturer in Divinity, and he's chair of our Master of Theological Studies, our MTS program committee. Professor McCannon has been at HDS since 2008, and he's the author of the recently published Eco-Alchemy, Anthroposophy, and the History and Future of Environmentalism, and the Documentary History of Unitarian Universalism, among others, of course. Dr. McCannon, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Karen, and thanks to all of you for uh, joining us today, and especially for the bravery to uh, come to us when we are very much in transition. Uh, we will be making pilgrimages back and forth between 
our space here borrowed for the day, our space at 60 Oxford borrowed for the year, as well as our regular space. And, and think of this as part of your religious pilgrimage experience. Uh, uh, um, I'm, I wear, as all of us do, several hats here. And uh, for this hour, I'm wearing my MTS hat. Uh, Harvard's Master of Theological Studies degree will equip you to be a responsible participant in scholarly conversations about religion and a member of a community of scholars that includes both academics and people who bring a sophisticated understanding of religion uh, to careers in public service, the arts, law, medicine, politics, and other fields. Uh, uh, our program is designed to provide you with the tools you need to be a full member of that community of scholars. These include a deep knowledge of a particular religious tradition or mode of inquiry, a broad awareness of the multiple ways that people can study religion, the capacity to write persuasively for both scholarly and more general publics, and an alertness to the dynamics of power and oppression within religious communities and within the community of scholars. As an MTS student, you would have enormous freedom in how exactly you would attain those tools for scholarly participation. Um, at the Divinity School, we offer an amazing array of courses each semester, but you can also take courses from across Harvard University and from our partner schools in the Boston Theological Institute. Uh, MTS students can also take advantage of the opportunities that are here because of the MDiv program, uh, such as um, having a field education placement. You're not obliged as an MTS, but you are allowed. Uh, uh, there are only, uh, there's only one required course uh, for MTS students, Theories and Methods in the Study of Religion, uh, frequently taught by David and shared with the MDiv uh, program. MTS students also demonstrate intermediate reading competence in one uh, language relevant to your studies, take six courses within an area of focus, and three courses outside that area. If you looked at that list of areas of focus, you might have found yourself a little bit bedazzled. Uh, uh, some of you may think, I'm interested in all of these. How can I choose? Others of you may think, the main thing I want to study isn't on the list. Does that mean Harvard's not the right fit for me? So let me just say how we came up with the list. We looked at our faculty, our course offerings, and asked what are some of the ways that a student could achieve a coherent program of study. Uh, we started listing them, and when we got to 18, we just quit. Uh, uh, so by identifying an area of focus, we're, say, we're promising you uh, that you can craft a coherent program of study in that area. It may be that you can craft a, uh, an, a coherent program of study in a different, in an area defined differently, uh, and if so, we're happy to accommodate through th that through the option of doing a self-designed area. Uh, try to grab me sometime during the day, if not during question time, if you have a particular area that you're not sure whether it would fit or not. Uh, uh, finally, I'd like to say a word about the kinds of people who choose Harvard's MTS program. Uh, many MTS students uh, hope to pursue academic careers as teachers or, and researchers in colleges and universities. The MTS provides a great start for that sort of career, as does the MDiv. Lots of students in both of our master's degrees are successful in doctoral admission. Many other MTS students have already committed to another career track in law, journalism, advocacy, you name it. They recognize that religion is an integral aspect of all parts of human experience, and they want to bring a scholarly understanding of religion to their chosen careers. Quite a few of those students will pursue dual degree programs with other Harvard schools or with the Fletcher School of Diplomacy at Tufts. Some choose the MTS because they want to pursue a specialized form of ministry and prefer the flexibility of the MTS over the MDiv which tries to initiate you in all the different arts of ministry. 
Finally, some students are on personal journeys of religious exploration or simply wish for two more years of a flexible liberal arts experience. Uh, we found uh, that the MTS works well for all those different types of people and that it works better for each one because you're in the classroom with the others and with our friends in the MDiv program. Uh, I was also asked to say a few things about cross-registration. Uh, uh, so uh, as a student here at the Divinity School, you can take up to half of your courses from beyond the Divinity School. That might be from other parts of Harvard. It might also be from the dozen or so uh, theological schools that are part of the Boston Theological Institute. If you have a particular connection to a tradition that is represented by one of the BTI schools, uh, blending Harvard's multi-religious approach with course offerings at, at that school can be a great choice for you. Uh, if you have a particular career path, other than the academic study of religion, uh, you may find helpful courses at the Public Health School, uh, the Kennedy School of Government, the Education School, uh, and so on. Uh, we work very closely with the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, and in fact, many of our colleagues in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences who offer courses on religion cross-list them with the Divinity School so you don't even have to go through the minor hassle of cross-registration for those courses. Now I'm open for questions specific to the MTS. Thank you for your remarks. Any questions? <clears throat> Hi, my name is Rachel. Um, to what extent is it feasible to transition from the MTS to the MDiv or vice versa? And how frequently does that occur? Yeah, um, you should spend some time in the next few months thinking about which is the right one for you and try to make as informed a, a choice as you can. Uh, that said, it is fairly common for students to arrive here and realize that uh, the choice they made was not quite the right one. Uh, and we have a fairly streamlined uh, uh, process uh, for shifting. We don't, we don't let people change degrees in their first semester. Uh, um, we basically ask that you do it sometime between the beginning of your second semester and the beginning of your third semester. So after you've had a little bit of time to really uh, get the lay of the land. Uh, the reason it's good to make as, as clear a choice as you can initially is that switching degrees can have implications for financial aid uh, that may not be favorable to you. Uh, but the process just involves having to talk with the financial aid people as well as with your academic advisor and with uh, me and Dudley as chairs of the two degrees. And it usually works out pretty smoothly and I'd say 15% uh, uh, switch degrees. There was a question here. Can we have a microphone here, please? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was just curious about the areas of study. Um, in addition to sort of you know, potentially creating your sort of own, is there a way to sort of combine two existing ones? So say I'm interested in both comparative religion and philosophy of religion. Is there a way to sort of merge them together? Thank you. Yeah, the thing I didn't say um, that I maybe should have is that your area of focus doesn't appear on your transcript. Uh, and I strongly encourage people when writing, you know, if you write your CV or apply for a job, you can describe what you studied in the MTS program using whatever language you like. Uh, you don't have to use our language to describe your studies here. Uh, so. So the answer basically is there's no reason to combine two. Uh, on, uh, the truth of the matter is that courses, our, our courses are typically affiliated with multiple areas of focus. So it may be that the curriculum that is right for you actually fits with more than one. And that's, that's expected, it's no big deal. Are there other questions for now? Oh yes. Hi, I have a question about the thesis. Uh, I know the option; it is an option in the MTS do thesis, and I was wondering um, to what extent 
am I um, potentially allowed to do like an independent that, but also create a thesis project? Because in my previous degree at Columbia, I did uh, a storytelling performance uh, in conjunction with philosophical thoughts and theological conceptions. So I wondered if that's a potential here. Um, and also I wonder if there is a requirement in terms of how many classes I could take outside of theology. I know, for example, other MTS programs allow up to two classes out, outside of theology. So I wonder if I were to focus on comparative studies for like uh, East Asian religion, so how does that work? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I think there's two parts uh, to the question. Um, so first, on the thesis. Uh, so as Dudley will say in a moment, the, uh, the MDiv has a required thesis, although we don't call it thesis. Uh, uh, the MTS does not, but there are, there are a couple of ways that you can do a sustained independent research project in the MTS. One is by working with an individual professor to craft a reading and research course uh, that can be structured any way that you like. The other is to participate in the MTS research seminar, uh, which is a year-long course where with a group of classmates, you develop a large uh, research project and get the feedback from those classmates as well as from uh, a teaching fellow. Uh, this year is, is kind of the pioneer year for that MTS research seminar. And we have, I'm trying to remember the numbers, uh, 14, so about um, a fifth or a sixth of, of this year's um, cohort of, of second year MTS students are, are participating in that. Um, I would also say um, that what I just said about area of focus applies here. Even though we don't use the language of thesis, if you complete a sustained research project during your MTS years and want to write on your CV that that was your MTS thesis, we have no objection to that. Uh, that's, that's totally fine. Uh, the other question, now I've lost it. Oh, yeah, so um, I think when you say outside of theology, that kind of points to the ambiguity in the name Master of Theological Studies, which theology is one of the areas of focus, and many students choose that area. Uh, many students in the MTS uh, are not pursuing theological study at all, um, but studies using other methods for the study of religion. Uh, there's a bureaucratic reason why we stick with the MTS name, uh, but don't, don't get tripped up over that. Uh, so in terms of courses outside the study of religion, uh, you are allowed to take 100% of your courses from the Divinity School. You are also allowed to take up to 50% of your courses outside the Divinity School. So some, some MTS students live very closely within the academic study of religion. Some are very... Uh, multidisciplinary in the, in the studies they pursue here. Yes, please. Hi. You, so you said that um, students within HDS can take classes uh, within the BTI schools. Are students from the BTI schools also permitted to take classes at HDS, and how many are they allowed to take? Uh, how many they're allowed to take, I would assume, depends on the rules of their home institution. Uh, I would say yeah, um, they, they, they definitely are you know, part of the classroom experience here. I would say about half of your that courses yes, will have BTI right. people in them. Maybe you actually look at the stats on this. Yeah, huh? yeah half. <laughs> half seems right. 40, um, sometimes 40, sometimes 50, sometimes 30. It, average, I would say half sounds right. And usually it would be one or two people. Uh, I've generally found their presence in the classroom to be enormously enriching. So maybe the last question for now, and then we can maybe have more at the end, please. I'm curious about the, the path of chaplaincy, and I'm looking just at the comparison between the MTS and the MDiv program, and that CPA, CPE is optional with MTS. With MDiv, it's not required, but I am also seeing like employment sector, like on the stats in the, in the little book here, that there's like 13% of um, the MDiv graduates go into chaplaincy, but 0% 
and that's 10 years after graduation, um, went into chaplaincy. Is there a reason for that discrepancy? Can you go for the MTS and still pursue a profession in chaplaincy? Is that? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. Uh, and it fits with what I was saying before about how some people find the MTS to be better for very specialized forms of ministry. I think I was mostly alluding to things that are more specialized, um, more narrowly focused than board certified chaplaincy. So if you want to be a board certified chaplain in a hospital and you are part of a religious tradition that is willing to ordain people like you, you probably should be pursuing ordination. Uh, and in that case, the MDiv is, uh, is the right choice. Um, if ordination is not an option for you, but you want to be a board certified chaplain, you're probably best served uh, by the MDiv, um, though you would need to, to look at that. Um, some people who are doing things that are like chaplaincy, uh, but not formally that, like say running a hospice program. Uh, and it may, if you want to run a hospice program and you have no interest in preaching uh, or um, some of the other arts of ministry, you might find that the MTS allows you to really double down on uh, uh, taking lots of pastoral care classes. Uh, but it's also the case that the, the credential of an MDiv is going to be more legible in the places where you pursue employment as a chaplain. So that was a perfect transition. Thank you very much for that question. I couldn't have done a better job myself, so great. Our third presenter this morning is Professor Dudley Rose. He's the Associate Dean for Ministry Studies and Lecturer on Ministry. He will present our MDiv program and the PA band. Dean Rose has been at HDS since 1987, and he envisioned and made the MDiv program into the amazing, engaging, and the premier program in ministry studies that it is today. Dean Rose is, of course, deeply involved in the program. He is the chair of the MDiv program committee, and he's teaching ministry studies. He's focusing his research on teaching on the life, thought, and ministry of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, congregational and institutional leadership, and use and effect of digital technology and social networking in society, churches, and ministry. And as I noted, Dean Rose will also talk about it, our THM program, please. Thank you very much, uh, Karen. I'll pay you later for the nice <laughs> introduction. <laughs> and uh, let me extend my welcome also to all of you who have made the trek here uh, to our uh, kind of fractured campus uh, right now, uh, and also to, to Cambridge. As uh, David said when we started, it, it's always a, a great wonder to see uh, a new potential cohort of students who uh, we hope many of you will uh, be in our classrooms next year. and. Uh, engaging with us and enhancing uh, the school. Let me say um, a bit about the MDiv program, but I won't uh, try to do it in detail. Uh, many of the things that have been said, as you've already gathered, uh, about other degree programs, particularly the MTS, apply to the MDiv, and students are in uh, those same classrooms. Uh, there's no sort of you sit on the left or sit on the right if you're in a particular <laughs> degree program. Uh, and so in some senses, as Dan said, we want you to try to apply to the right program, but when you're here, you will be together more than you will be apart. Um, the MDiv degree program has a long history in a way here at Harvard uh, because Harvard University itself was formed uh, initially for the preparation of ministers. And a couple of hundred of years ago, uh, in their wisdom, they uh, thought that we should have a, a divinity school, and uh, so it broke off from the university itself. Uh, and it began then still in that original compass as a program to prepare 
uh, Protestant clergy, if we look back 200 years ago. Today, the program is uh, very much reconfigured from that. We still have many people who go into ordained ministry or allied fields like chaplaincy or uh, parachurch ministries, but we have folks who go into uh, any number of fields, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, it's not just for ordination, whereas in the past, uh, in, and under its original conception, uh, that would have been an expectation of students who uh, came to the program. And uh, since about 2005, it has formally not been specifically a Christian program. That is, you can prepare for uh, what we're going to use the term ministry to mean something very broad. You can prepare for ministry in any number of traditions using somewhat the language of the MTS uh, in those traditions for which we have the resources here at the university to prepare you. So if you come in a tradition that we have no resources, I'm sorry to say we will not hire a whole faculty for you. But uh, if you come, uh, if you look at the, the breadth of the uh, teaching in the university, you'll find that many of our religious, or many of the religious traditions are uh, possible. Uh, our careers, the, the uh, things that our students go into, about 35 or 45 percent go into ordained leadership in religious communities or lay ministries or chaplaincy. Um, another 20 to 28 percent, depending on the year, go into uh, college uh, or university teaching or administration. Many of those, most of those, would then be going on to doctoral programs as a part of that preparation. The remainder go into careers such as public policy, uh, nonprofit management, community development, counseling, law, medicine, and government. Um, we have, because of the breadth of careers that are possible here, and many of which um, are not as uh, formally laid out as, say, chaplaincy and uh, ordained ministry, we have a very robust career services office that uh, will help you enormously uh, prepare to uh, talk with potential employers to think about the careers that you might want to pursue uh, subsequent to here. We have denominational counselors in uh, over uh, uh, 10 of our of the, uh, religious traditions and denominations. So if you're preparing for uh, ministry in a particular religious tradition or denomination, there will be uh, denominational counselors. And then our office, the Office of Ministry Studies, uh, which oversees the denominational counselors, also has a staff that oversees the program as a whole, oversees field education, and is there to counsel you uh, about your uh, vocational uh, directions. So there's a, there are lots of uh, opportunities to think through the, uh, the pathways that you want to pursue. I'm going to say a word about the, re the requirements. Um, the, like all schools, I think the requirements can be, if you get down into the weeds, can be relatively complex. Uh, I would say that here, compared to many of the divinity schools that you may look at, the word will be flexibility. Um, the uh, it's designed, uh, as I just said, to support a variety of career, path, career paths or credentialing requirements or preparation for further graduate education. Um, and most of the requirements are met through distribution. Uh, three courses are required. Um, one, which is, uh, as Dan said, is uh, with the MTS students, the theories and methods in the study of religion, uh, an introduction to ministry studies, which is also taken in the first fall, uh, and at the end, a senior seminar, which is a companion to writing the senior paper or the thesis. The um, other requirement that uh, we have, which is similar to the MTS, is a language requirement. Uh, it can be met either by the language requirement standards of the MTS, intermediate competency, or by taking three courses in a language uh, while you're here at the Divinity School. And just to say, that des design was meant uh, in the hopes that you would be reading languages. Uh, so if, 
even if you are an advanced student, uh, say in Hebrew, you can take three advanced courses in Hebrew to meet your language requirement and continue reading at a higher level. Um, it, the program, it should be obvious, I suppose, has a bit of a, uh, has a focus uh, on religion, although you can take courses that are not specifically related to religious traditions. But we do require you to take a certain number of them that, it, that directly address religious traditions. Some of those may be more than one tradition in the class, but that but nonetheless addresses religious traditions. And we require that you have some uh, exposure, at least three courses outside of any uh, center weight of religious tradition that you might be pursuing. The obvious example is if you were pers pursuing a, 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 a career uh, or a vocation in ordained Christian ministry, we're going to require that you have three courses outside of Christianity that focus on some other religion or religions, and they don't have to be the same. You get three different religions if you, if you wish. Um, as Dan said, the BTI and other faculties are available to you, and they are uh, something that we would recommend. And let me just uh, then end by saying that the data that we see indicates uh, from our graduates who are five to 10 years out uh, from graduation are almost all uh, working in the fields that they hope to and generally have reported uh, a high degree of satisfaction with their preparation at Harvard Divinity School. So we're very proud of that record on both counts. Thank you. Can someone also say a little oh. bit about the THM? THM, yes, I will say a word about the THM. So the THM is uh, another uh, historic uh, program. <laughs> it's uh, called, it's the, uh, it's a one-year program that is designed, was originally designed for people who had done an MDiv, who had been out in ministry and wanted to come back and pursue some sustained study uh, for a, an academic year. Um, it still serves that purpose, uh, but we, it, uh, like other uh, programs, has been broadened. Um, it's it serves. Uh, students who maybe uh, are, would like to apply to, for doctoral work but know that they need to shore up particular parts of their uh, courses of study or resume. Uh, it serves people who are coming back or coming from uh, other fields, uh, from uh, fields in religion, maybe uh, journalism, other such fields, and would like to have a year of study in religion. Um, it's a small program. It requires that um, uh, students know that uh, there is someone here that can oversee the work that they want to do, someone on the faculty. So pay attention to that if you're in, in the situation of thinking about that program. Uh, it, it also has a language requirement and a thesis or a two paper uh, requirement. So it's a lot packed into a single year, and I'd be glad to talk with any of you who uh, may be interested in that. At this point, my guess is that's a, uh, at least as speculative as uh, the doctoral program for most of you. Any other questions? Please, do we have a microphone? Hi, I'm Natalie. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the difference in the third year of study in the MDiv program and what, um, how the ordination process is woven into that. That's a great question. Um, I don't, I don't know that I've ever answered that question before <laughs> because we don't tend to think of it as a, a particular year aimed at ordination. Um, so let me come at it from a, a little more obliquely. Uh, we encourage students who are thinking about ordination uh, to be in contact with our denominational counselors, with their own judicatories, to know through your whole course of study what do you need to do to map, meet our requirements and also meet the requirements of uh, your tradition. So that, in that sense, it goes through the whole uh, program. 
we require two units of field education as part of the MDiv program, uh, but we do not require those to be held until the end of the program. So many students uh, do field education in their first year, and, and many may do it first year and a summer by doing, say, CPE, which many denominations require. So many folks going into their third year will have already done many of the courses and many of the uh, kinds of experiences that their denominations expect of them. Um, including polity courses, history courses, and so on. So the third year, um, we hope your thesis will um, pick up some of the threads of your Master of Divinity degree and aim at some uh, notion of ministry. And again, that's broadly construed. These uh, theses run from highly academic to highly project-oriented. Uh, but they are a way to shape uh, your thinking and a conversation with uh, your denominational bodies, uh, judicatory bodies. Um, again, it'll depend s so much on um, individual denominations, which have different requirements for how long you have to be within the denomination to uh, be ready for ordination, what steps you have to jump through. I would suppose, ideally, uh, that, that you would prepare yourself so that in your third year, um, you would be able to look for uh, employment, uh, say, in the spring of that year, uh, so that uh, in the summer or fall, you could go into um, a church uh, or other organization. Does that get what you want? Thank you. We have another question over here. Hi. Uh, first, I just want to thank you all for your time. It's, it's truly appreciated. Um, so uh, my name is Nick Mariakis, and I'm uh, just about to wrap up my MDiv. And so I'm planning to apply to the THM, uh, uh, focusing on possibly Hebrew Bible, New Testament, or the broader Christian theology. I, I'm curious to know... Uh, how I can go about obtaining some specificity with regards to uh, the types of courses that I can curate. Um, mm -hmm. I'm particularly interested in sort of getting a preview in advance of, of what those classes might be. And uh, if you could speak uh, to the, the thesis a, a bit more, I would very much appreciate that. So okay. thank you all. You're very welcome. It, it may be better to answer that more f fully offline, but, um, but briefly, you have a lot of latitude in the THM to to choose the courses that you want so that you can focus for uh, on and uh, particular courses and for a particular situation. Um, the thesis, the, the way it, it works is either two of the papers that you do in the, in the uh, course of your study can be combined, presumably they're somewhat related, uh, to count for the thesis, or a thesis itself can be written. Um, and then there's an examination, usually with your advisor and a small committee. Um, that's sort of an overview. Does that answer what you're after? Uh, yeah, that, that, that's helpful. And then uh, offline, if uh, you're for lunch, perhaps the, uh, yeah. the previous course would be much, much, very helpful. Okay, great. Thank you so much. All you right, bet. so I'm sorry I'm being told we got to kind of wrap it up, but I wish you would um, maybe seek us out for lunch or at another opportunity. In closing, I want to thank the members of the panels, Professor Holland, McCannon, and Rose, for taking the time to speak with us this morning about the amazing degree programs that the Harvard Divinity School offers. Um, I also thank you for your questions and for your interest in the work that we do at HDS all year round. We hope to see you all back again next summer, and I hope you'll enjoy the rest of your visit. Thanks so much. Thank